hit the subscribe button or visit us at auau.auanet.org. Good afternoon and welcome to AUA's Prostate Cancer Update 2020 webinar. We thank you for joining us. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. The AUA is accredited by the ACCME and designates this internet live activity for a maximum of 1.5 AMA PRA Category 1 credits. Course handouts from the presentations have been made available to you. Please visit AUA University to access the handouts. Evaluations are very important to us. Course evaluations and CME credit will be administered electronically on AUA University immediately following the webinar. As the AUA continues to develop virtual education that meets your needs, we welcome your feedback regarding both the content and the format of this webinar. All persons in a position to control the content of an AUA educational activity are required to disclose any relevant financial relationships with any commercial interest. Please visit the AUA University to review Faculty and Education Council disclosures. Coding advice given during presentations are the opinion of the presenters and may not have been vetted through the AUA for accuracy. Please verify accuracy prior to reporting on medical claims. We hope that you will actively participate as you connect and learn from each other during the course. Due to the size of the audience, all participants will be in listen-only mode without video, but we encourage you to ask questions at any time. Questions will be answered uh, at the conclusion of the program. Get social with the AUA. Share your highlights from the AUA virtual experience with the Global Urology Community Online. Tag AUA Virtual EXP and the AUA at Amer Urological. Please stay tuned for a keyword that will be provided during the webinar. The keyword is used to verify your participation in the webinar. You will need to use this keyword to access the course evaluation, CME credit claim, and certificate. The AUA would like to thank the following companies for providing independent educational grants in support of this webinar. Estellis, AstraZeneca, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Genentech, Merck, Pfizer Incorporated, Santa Fe Genzyme. Please take a moment to review the course learning objectives shown here. Learning objectives can also be found on AUA University. Finally, I'd like to extend a special thank you to our course director, Dr. William Catalona, for his time, talent, and expertise in developing this program and all participating faculty. Before we begin the webinar, we will take a few minutes to conduct a knowledge assessment. Please note that there will be a follow-up assessment utilizing these same questions on AUA University at the conclusion of the webinar. Correct answers will be given upon completion of the follow-up assessment. Welcome everybody, and we're very pleased that you would join us. Sorry that we cannot meet in person. I'm gonna ask, answer, uh, ask the questions. First is question one, which of the following trends have been observed in the US prostate cancer statistics? A, continuous increase in incidence. B, continuous decrease in mortality. C, decreased incidence of high risk disease. D, decreased low risk and increased high risk disease. Okay. Please take a few moments to answer the question. Just a couple more seconds. Okay, moving on to question two. Our next question, question two, treatment with 5-alpha reductase inhibitors is associated with which of the following? A, delay in the diagnosis of prostate cancer. B, earlier diagnosis of prostate cancer. C, increased incidence of low-grade prostate cancers. Or D, decreased incidence of high-grade prostate cancers. Okay. 
Great. A few more seconds to get your responses in. Okay. Moving on to question three. Question three. Sorry. Sorry. Question Sorry. three. Magnetic resonance imaging targeted prostate biopsies. A can rule out clinically significant prostate cancer. B, are reproducible across institutions. C, require fusion technology to be effective. Or D, can reduce reclassification rates in men on active surveillance. Another few seconds before we move on to the next question. Okay, on to question four. Question four, hypofractionated radiation therapy to the prostate consisting of 42.7 gray over seven days as compared to 78 gray over 39 days, A, results in the same biochemical outcome with increased acute and late genital urinary toxicity. B, results in the same biochemical outcome with increased acute genital urinary toxicity only. C, requires short-term hormonal therapy to achieve the same biochemical outcome. Or D, is more expensive overall. Okay, thank you everyone for your responses. Moving on to the fifth and final question. Question number five, which of the following is a standard of care option for first line metastatic castrate sensitive prostate cancer? A, ADT plus darolutamide, B, ADT plus docetaxel, C, ADT plus cabazitaxel, or D, ADT plus pembrolizumab. Right. Looks like 81% of you have responded. Those of you who have not responded, just go ahead and submit your response now and we'll close the poll in a few moments. Okay. That concludes our knowledge assessment. Thank you so much for participating. Do I click on these slides? Dr. Catalona will now introduce the course. Okay, if everyone would please uh, share their webcams. And uh, how do I take over the slides here? There we go. So I'd like to introduce our panel. Uh, I'm Dr. Catalona. Uh, Doug Dow is a <clears throat> urologist and uh, an excellent uh, 
robotic and, ge and, and general urological surgeon at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, Stan Liao is uh, a radiation oncologist at the University of Chicago. Uh, Stacy Loeb is a urologist and an expert in epidemiology and prostate cancer biomarkers, and also is quite an expert in terms of social media at New York University. Uh, Robert Nadler is a urologist and also a, a, uh, an excellent uh, general urologic surgeon and especially robotic surgeon at uh, Northwestern. And Rus Russell Schmulowitz is a, a medical oncologist at the University of Chicago, who's not only an excellent clinician, but he is also a molecular biologist doing cutting edge research. So I would like to thank them all for join it, joining us again this year in the Prostate Cancer Update course. Uh, the, this shows the presenters' disclosures that are available through the AUA. And our agenda really is going to be to cover the entire uh, field of uh, clinical uh, prostate cancer uh, uh, knowledge. And uh, the objective of this course every year is to review the English language literature on prostate cancer for the past year. And we select articles and topics that have immediate or possible near-term relevance to the practicing urologist. So we want to make this relevant to the urologist who's out there in practice. So I'm going to uh, begin to cover some slides on the epidemiology and genetics of prostate cancer. Uh, the American Cancer Society just revealed the 2020 statistics, and uh, it, it is interesting that not only for prostate cancer, but for many other cancers, the cancer death rate uh, has been declining in recent decades. How, however, over the past decade, uh, the reductions have slowed for female breast and colorectal cancer, and actually, the reductions in the death rates for prostate cancer have actually halted and actually increased somewhat. Uh, and this is uh, probably uh, partially due to the aftermath of the U.S. Preventive Services uh, Task Force. And, uh, and this article shows that, that in, in the task force, uh, since the task force uh, recommendation, the the percentage of low-grade prostate cancers has decreased, but uh, there has also been a corresponding increase in the percentage of patients uh, who present at diagnosis with advanced prostate cancer. Um, this is a slide that really hasn't changed much over the past decades, and it's the five-year relative survival rates for the stage of prostate cancer at the time of diagnosis. And if it's detected while it's localized or regional, the five-year survival rate is nearly 100%. But in patients presenting with distant metastases, the five-year survival rate really has remained at around uh, 30% uh, in recent decades. And this slide just shows the American Cancer Society uh, incidence curve for prostate cancer. One can see that beginning around 1991, with the introduction of PSA testing, the incidence rate skyrocketed as previously undetectable cases became uh, apparent. And then with the first uh, U.S. Preventive Services uh, uh, Task Force recommendation against screening men over 75 in 2010 and, and, and against screening all men in, in 2012, the, the, the incidence of prostate cancer in the country uh, de declined really dramatically, almost to the levels that they were before the PSA era. And this just shows the prostate cancer mortality rate, which uh, between 1990 and uh, around uh, 2013 or 2014, th there was a 52% decrease in the prostate cancer specific mortality rate, but again, one can see now for the first time there is uh, beginning to be a little bit of an uptick in the prostate cancer mortality rate in the aftermath of the task force recommendation. Stacy, this study is looking yes. Hi, 
Hi, Hi. everybody. This study is looking at uh, changes in the incidence of non-metastatic and metastatic prostate cancer. So you can see on the left side of the screen is non-metastatic disease. On the top, you have men ages 50 to 74, and on the bottom is men ages 75 and above. And you can see that non-metastatic disease has decreased over time, whereas on the right side are these same age groups, but for distant metastases. And you can see a slow, gradual increase over time for the men 50 to 74, and a significant and larger increase uh, more recently for the men age 75 and above. And <clears throat> Although we, you know, cannot classically think of prostate cancer as a disease of, of, of older men, uh, previous studies have suggested that, in fact, in, in younger men, there is an increase in incidence. So in this paper, uh, the authors looked at incidence stage grade mortality from the SEER U.S. data, as well as incident mortality information um, across the globe. And interestingly, what they found is that the incidence of prostate cancer in ages 15 to 40, so in younger men, increases has been increasing globally since around 1990 at around 2% per year. And importantly, and, and what likely echoes what many of us see in practice, is that the younger these younger men are at higher risk for uh, bad outcomes with prostate cancer. And, and this study showed that this age group was greater than six times more likely than older men to have distant metastatic disease at the time of diagnosis. So that there are really now two peaks for aggressive prostate cancer in the very young and in the very old. And then it seems to be lower in the middle years. Dan? Uh, many of us have likely managed men who need their prostate cancer treated and cured before a solid organ transplant can be done. This study sought to evaluate whether men diagnosed with prostate cancer who have either a future or a prior transplant have any worse cancer mortality. The SEER Medicare database was polled over a 20-year period and found 620 men with transplant history who were then matched one to five to men without transplant. With the median follow-up of five and a half years, there was a lower overall survival for men with transplant, as we would expect, but no difference in cancer mortality, which was 6% in both groups at 10, at 10 years. Cancer mortality was not influenced by the type of local therapy, so surgery, external beam, and brachytherapy all did similarly. A subset analysis of men with low-risk features showed no difference in cancer mortality comparing men who were treated with men who were not, suggesting that local therapy may not necessarily always be required before transplant. So overall, this is uh, one of the largest studies on this subject matter, suggesting that men with transplant history could be managed per usual standards. I think it's really important because we this comes up a lot with patients who are being considered for transplant. They may be, have an elevated PSA found before their transplant, and they clearly need to be moving on with their organ transplant rather than worrying about prostate cancer and whether it will be affected by the immunosuppression. Yeah, absolutely. So this study is moving on to a slightly different topic, which is 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. And there's been a lot of studies, you know, do 5-alpha reductase inhibitors cause, you know, a reduction in low-grade disease or more high-grade disease? This is really a different kind of study. This is looking at out in the real world in men who are using 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, are they having a delayed diagnosis due to the PSA suppression from the medications? So this is looking at more than 80,000 men in the VA healthcare system with prostate cancer. And the people who were on 5-alpha reductase inhibitors and those who were not had exactly the same PSA at diagnosis. It was around 6, but when you actually adjust for the finasteride, that's really about 13 for the finasteride users. And so they had a longer time from their real first elevated PSA until they had a biopsy and correspondingly had more advanced features and higher rates of prostate cancer mortality. So the study was really raising questions over whether enough uh, patients and physicians are aware that 5-alpha reductase inhibitors do suppress PSA and if the levels are being adjusted. And it's tough, you know, people come in with a long med list to take into consideration every factor. But without that, these men are being diagnosed later. And actually, if you want to advance to the next slide, the next study is really looking at the same type of thing. 
Yeah, it's not advancing here. Uh, I think we missed one, but the same authors basically looked at this again. Uh, the last study image was in the VA healthcare system. This one is looking at 30,000 men in the SEER Medicare database. Same study question. Men who took 5 alpha reductase inhibitors before diagnosis had like twice as high of a PSA level at diagnosis once you adjust for the finasteride use. And again, of course, since they were diagnosed at much higher PSA levels, they had more high-grade disease and worse outcomes. So just suggesting, you know, very important that we collaborate with our colleagues in internal medicine and primary care and make sure that patients are also aware of the effect that these medications has on their PSA. Also, a lot of people just assume because you have BPH, you don't have prostate cancer, but I think with the advent of MRI and better biopsies, I see that really both of the diseases coexist. So there's also that assumption that the urologists have to fight against, so to speak, with the internists. So, Robert, your uh, your microphone is not coming through very clearly. Uh, I don't know. You, it may be better if you called in on the telephone. The computer microphone is not coming through as very, very, very clearly. Okay, can you uh, hear me better now? We can, but it's a little bit distorted. Okay. Um, so this is a paper, again, that that uh, looks at uh, uh, men who had a first degree family history of breast cancer, and these men are at uh, a slightly higher risk uh, for having prostate cancer. And it's, it's known that some of the genetic variants if they end up in a man, will make him more susceptible to prostate cancer, and if they end up in a woman, make make her more susceptible to breast cancer. So, uh, patients with a first degree relative uh, are higher risk patients. This comes up pretty uh, increasingly frequently lately as these BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. So, this was a prospective cohort study of quite a large number of patients, almost a thousand patients in the uh, UK and Ireland. BRCA2 is a far more significant uh, uh, gene risk uh, with an absolute prostate cancer risk of 4.5%. Um, and overall, 27% of men by age 75 and 60% by age 85 will get prostate cancer in those who carry the BRCA. This is correlated with increase with their family history. So again, as Dr. Catalona said, the family history is important. It's been linked to certain mutations. So sequencing the gene can be helpful in counseling the patients about their specific risk and certain certain positions, certain mutations are, are the highest risk. Um, they also are not only associated with prostate cancer, but higher Gleason score cancer and higher risk of prostate cancer death. BRCA1 is the less aggressive of the mutations, but they still have a significantly increased risk of prostate cancer of over two times. Uh, and, a, and it's also at a younger age at three, point, three and a half times greater risk. Um, all of these are age related as is prostate cancer, but uh, these are really significant risk factors that ought to be considered and discussed with your patients. So, you know, some people say that men who have, who have prostate cancer with BRCA2 Mutations should not be considered for active surveillance because they are, um, you know, they're more likely to have aggressive disease. So, Doug, if you had a BRCA1 carrier, which is less, you know, strongly associated with aggressive disease, would you, uh, would you say he should not be treated with, or he should not be managed with active surveillance? I counsel the patients in this situation that we really don't know, and so my cautious view is that we should treat them, not surveil them, because I have seen. A number of patients with both of these mutations have very, very aggressive disease. Okay. It's, um, it, just, it's interesting to me that the if you go back to the, the the age, 27% by whatever it was, age 65. Uh, 65 um, are you uh, in, in patients who have BRCA2 positive disease, are you screening them any differently? <laughs> or how do you approach that? So this is uh, actually, this study sort of looks into that. This is called the IMPACT study, and it's, uh, it's a large international study in which um, the, they, they compare men who are carriers or men who are not carriers 
of the, of the BRCA uh, mutations. And if their PSA is over three, uh, they do um, they do a biopsy on them. And uh, so uh, again, they they find an increased risk uh, for aggressive disease with the BRCA2 uh, and an increased risk with BRCA1, but the association with the really aggressive disease, again, uh, still requires further study. But uh, certainly any man who ha is a carrier of this should be screened if, they, if, if his PSA is higher than the median for his age group. Stacy. So this study is uh, just describing the EAU guidelines from 2019, and their position is to encourage appropriate prostate cancer early detection where we would be trying to best individualize protocols in an effort to uh, still detect cancer early while reducing overdiagnosis and overtreatment. Their approach does include baseline PSA at age 45 and uh, individualizing screening intervals. They encourage integration of tools such as MRI and risk calculators to help decide on biopsy and always considering life expectancy versus cancer mortality risk as part of decision making, as well as encouraging active surveillance for well informed patients with favorable risk cancer. And does that include uh, favorable intermediate risk cancer? And how would you define that? Yeah, so uh, they incorporate select patients with favorable intermediate risk cancer. So I think it's all about shared decision making. Certainly, this population has a higher risk of metastasis than grade group one, but uh, there are some men in this subset who are more favorable than others. And we will get to the active surveillance section shortly with some of the updated data on active surveillance for grade group one and grade group two. So we'll be able to take a closer look at that. So um, this is um, uh, a very important paper that was um, written by the, by the group at, um, at Cornell University. Uh, they were the ones, this group were the ones who, who really unearthed the flaws of the PLECO study and showing that more than 90% of the controls uh, in, uh, in the PLECO study had been screened and, and which sort of invalidated it as a true study of screening versus no screening. And in this, uh, in this paper, which just recently came out in the New England Journal of Medicine, in a modeling study uh, and looking at the long-term benefits of screening, a very, very strong group of authors showed that with long-term follow-up uh, that the benefits of PSA screening may be much more favorable than is generally appreciated uh, in the, from looking at the literature. And uh, again, this, uh, this, this is another paper, another statistical modeling paper uh, that, uh, that examined uh, either lengthening screening intervals <clears throat> in men who have very low PSAs or even considering stopping screening completely in men whose PSA is less than one at age 60. And, um, and they pointed out that one, this would you know, decrease the number of screening tests that were done. It would decrease the overdiagnosis, but it would also could significantly decrease the number of prostate cancer uh, lives saved. Now, on a, the other major study of screening is the European randomized study, and this is some longer term data looking at uh, the same uh, endpoints, the number invited to screen. As the further out that they've studied this, the uh, more important it shows, especially over time, that you have to uh, screen fewer people treat fewer people to get the endpoint of lives saved and metastasis aborted. Uh, within the European group, there has been quite a big discrepancy in the different countries in the, the level of screening and in the contamination. But what you see on the graph here is important. So the, the uh, brown uh, dotted line are the people that were screened after the first round. 
versus the blue line is the people who were diagnosed at the very first screening. And in that first group, round one, they found a lot of the patients had PSAs over 20. They had pretty advanced disease. And the people that were screened later, they were far more likely to have long-term prostate cancer survival. There really is a big difference. So, you know, we, of course, we worry about finding prostate cancers too early and treating them too aggressively, but it's very clear that if you find them too late, uh, there's a big difference in prostate cancer mortality. Robert? This is uh, looking at the PLECO database, which is the largest to date with 10,000 men in 13 year follow up, trying to define could we decrease the frequency of PSA? One shortcoming with this data set is that really only 13, you know, a small number of men developed uh, prostate cancer where they went on to die of it. So it's sort of hard to extrapolate. And the, the follow up isn't super long at 13 years. Nevertheless, not surprisingly, men with lower PSAs less than 2.0, they felt they could screen less frequently. And they questioned whether if the PSA was less than 1.0, whether they could possibly discontinue it. Personally, I think that there probably can be less screening with lower PSAs, but I think it's going to be hard to implement and confusing for the internists. Uh, so I think if they're on top of it, you might be able to decrease the frequency from yearly. If not, I think it's probably better at the high risk age groups to screen regularly with your regular screen. Uh, this looks at MRI targeted and systematic biopsies in prostate cancer. Numerous studies have shown that MRI targeted biopsy alone is not going to detect as many cancers as combination. And numerous studies have shown that combination doesn't detect as many as, or systemic or systematic doesn't detect as many as combined. Bottom line in this study is you should still do MRI targeted biopsies and you still should do systematic biopsies uh, in these patients. So this is, this is another study uh, comparing uh, systematic versus MRI uh, targeted biopsy. This is called the ASSIST study. And again, um, it pre pretty much brings up the uh, the same point that uh, in using uh, in doing these biopsies, particularly in in patients who are in active surveillance, uh, one should do both the MRI targeted and systematic biopsies to get the most accurate information. And this is another study looking specifically at men on active surveillance. Now, they talk about a tract biopsy. So a tract biopsy is going back and biopsying areas that have shown cancer previously. And what they recommended is don't just biopsy the MRI targeted areas on men on active surveillance. Also go, by, go back and biopsy areas that have shown previous cancer, even if it's Gleason 3 plus 3. Uh, those are at higher risk for turning into you know, 3 plus 4 or 4 plus 3 cancers. They also felt that PSA density uh, was important in upgrading amongst the patients. That makes sense. I think PSA density is important, but as I said, it's not the be all and end all. BPH and prostate cancer both can coexist pretty happily. So I think the bottom line is you need to be thorough and systematic uh, in your active surveillance patients and don't rely on MRI alone, um, and if you're going to biopsy, be thorough. This, uh, this slide shows um, a list of commercially available biomarkers, and, and I had to put two of them in red font uh, because we're not allowed to use, uh, in AUA programs, we're not really allowed to uh, mention commercial, uh, individual commercial products without uh, also mentioning their their competitors, uh, and uh, this is uh, is a study that there's some uh, conflict in the literature now about whether these genomic risk class uh, classifiers are useful, particularly in patients with active surveillance. And um, this is a paper that basically shows that there is a correlation between this 
GPS, genomic risk classifier, with histologic patterns of prostate cancer that are known to be more aggressive, such as the crib reform pattern and some other patterns, so that the genetics can also correlate with the histology. Uh, this is, uh, this is a, a paper uh, that also uh, looked at uh, the GPS um, study, uh, GPS markers uh, in patients uh, with prostate cancer. And the bottom line of this study is that it did appear to be useful. However, uh, in another patient paper that, that just came out in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, a, a few months ago from another very excellent group of researchers, the, the Canary uh, Pass Consortium, uh, they found that the GPS score uh, showed no association with subsequent biopsy upgrades. So we have two studies of this particular uh, genomic marker from excellent institutions, excellent investigators. One shows it's useful in active surveillance and the other shows it's totally useless. So for a marker to be valuable, it should really perform well across institutions and across patient populations. So the, the jury is still out on these, uh, on these markers. And uh, this is, uh, again, uh, another marker, the decipher marker, which, uh, which uh, was evaluated in this study. And this uh, marker in a group of patients who would have been candidates for active surveillance, but they all underwent radical prostatectomy. Decipher was an independent predictor of adverse pathology. So the jury is really still out on these genomic markers. Now switching over to MRI technology. This is a uh, nice paper that's talking about all the changes uh, over the last couple of years. It's become quite clear what the important technical uh, requirements are for performing MRI, that it's useful. And this paper gives the standard operating procedures with very technical uh, information about how the radiologist should sequence the MRI and how it should be interpreted with the PyRADS version two system. So this, this panel of AUA and, and radiology uh, experts evaluated the, the uh, current literature um, and is clear that MRI is uh, useful in men with a previous negative biopsy uh, and ongoing concern about uh, increased risk of prostate cancer such as continued elevated PSA. And there is now clearly data that uh, supports the use before biopsy in all men who have no history of biopsy. Uh, that's really important uh, and I think that's become a real standard uh, around the country and I think especially as the MRI uh, there's more consistency in the way in the protocols and the reading and interpretation that's become more and more helpful. Uh, at this point though there's evidence is insufficient to use it as a screening tool um, and it's still very much up to date up to debate about how useful it is in staging for deciding on clinical management or in as a substitute to biopsy and active surveillance. I think those are the are really clearly um, not appropriate uses yet. What is the what kind of tumors are tend to be overlooked by MRI? It's really uh, a very good technology, but there are some important um, tumors that are overlooked. The Promise study uses a transperineal approach, and they do a, essentially a saturation biopsy uh, transperineal, and then they did a standard uh, systematic sextant transrectal biopsy after the MRI. They did not use any kind of commercially available image guidance system. Uh, they found that um, MRI tend to find the higher volume, higher grade tumors. There were some what we would consider clinically significant tumors that were missed, but they were really usually uh, on average much smaller and tended to be lower grade. So on average, the ones that were missed were three millimeters in length in core length versus eight millimeters on the ones that were showed up on MRI. Uh, and on the MRI did not miss any grade, uh, grade group three or higher tumors missed in this study. Other imaging modalities that I think we're going to be hearing a lot more about are really important, uh, has not yet been approved in the U.S., is the Gallium PSMA PET scan. Uh, this is one study, uh, a prospective study, looking at patients who had failed either radiation or prostatectomy with a rising PSA. They found a very high sensitivity and specificity uh, for this new PSMA PET scan and really correlated 
very well with uh, pathologic uh, biopsies. The graph shows you that it really is dependent on the on the PSA. So unfortunately, in the common scenario we're all in of taking care of patients with a slowly rising low PSA less than 0.5. They did have a substantial detection rate, up to 45% or so, uh, clearly much better at the higher levels of PSA, um, but and this is all much better than the currently available uh, PET imaging tracers that we have. So that. This is another study in Lancet looking at PSMA PET CT in high-risk prostate cancer patients before surgery. And similarly, PET CT at a 27% or PSMA PET CT had a 27% greater accuracy, 92% versus 65%. Uh, conventional imaging had lower sensitivity, 38% versus 84%, 85% and specificity. PSMA PET CT is far superior at evaluating nodal and distant metastases. Uh, and interestingly, higher radiation exposure for these patients. Uh, I mean, I think PSMA, CT is going to be the way to go, but it, again, it's not readily available, uh, which is a problem. Uh, Stacy or Doug, do you have any experience with it, or what are your thoughts on when it's going to be available? Oh, well, I've seen patients who've gone over overseas to get the study, um, and it really is amazingly better and more accurate than the the ones that we have now. Um, my, I'm getting rumor, hearing rumors that it is close to being approved by the FDA, but that's just just rumors. Uh, I think it will be very helpful. This is another study that's that looking specifically at post prostatectomy patients, a multicenter now retrospective study. These are patients with detectable PSA after prostatectomy. Again, very clear on the on the graphs that we put here. Um, the pelvic nodal uh, areas show where they uh, found either persistence or recurrence uh, after prostate can after prostatectomy. Again, very clearly related to the total PSA. So again, clearly in the there are about a third of patients who are there's benefit to studying them with a PSMA PET at a PSA of less than 0.5. Often you find localized disease with um, the, in the uh, the green is the metastatic disease. So there's a lot of patients who could be potentially affected uh, favorably by a, additional localized treatment, even in these higher PSA ranges. And I think that's going to be a real important uh, model for us uh, that a large percentage of these patients only have nodal nodal only disease. The study compared PSMA PET with the more widely available and FDA-approved mucyclovine PET, also known as Axumin. As a reminder, the gallium-68 PSMA radio tracer follows folate metabolism, whereas the F18 mucyclovine follows amino acid metabolism. In this study, 50 men underwent both scans within two weeks of one another with three blinded readers, radiologists um, to, blinded to the other scans. In men with a median PSA of 0.48 after radical prostatectomy, the detection rate was much better for the PSMA PET tracer at 56% versus 26%. The SUVs were higher. The inter-observer variability was also reduced for the PSMA PET, which had better test characteristics. So um, the bottom line is that the PSMA PET is uh, the clear winner, but the tracer does have the challenges of the shorter half-life and the regulatory approval issues. So moving on to active surveillance. So this is follow-up from the Johns Hopkins Active Surveillance Program, which included men with uh, grade group one or at least in six prostate cancer. And as they've reported previously, at 10 years, the risk of metastasis or death was well below 1%. In fact, four men out of 1,800 had died from prostate cancer in the history of this program. Um, and uh, 48% had switched to treatment after 10 years, although about a fifth of men switched uh, just due to preference alone. So it wasn't always for biological indications. So that's important to recognize. Now, the patients who did have the MRI uh, as part of their initial biopsy and had a targeted biopsy had lower rates of reclassification. So, you know, just another word about improved upfront staging can really help with patient selection. Uh, this is uh, going along with the same line of thought. This is from Dr. Carlson, excellent study from Memorial Sloan Kettering, looking at their outcomes with active surveillance for grade group one prostate cancer, more than 2,600 patients. And, you know, 
similar result here. The risk of any kind of metastasis uh, was less than 1% at 10 years. They had only one prostate cancer death in this series, and treatment-free probability was 58% here at 15 years. So bottom line, a lot of men are able to avoid treatment for many, many years, and risk of anything bad happening in terms of metastases or death for grade group one within a 10-year period is extremely rare. This is a recently reported study from MD Anderson, Dr. Greg at MD Anderson. This was a prospective study of, in an active surveillance cohort. And the contribution here was they found that looking at the tumor length in the biopsies, and especially not only the baseline biopsies, but the confirmatory biopsies was, was a marker for ultimate uh, Gleason uh, upgrade. Uh, so patients who had more of the cores involved were more likely to have their, uh, their tumors be uh, subsequently upgraded. This study is looking at reasons for discontinuation of active surveillance. So kind of the flip side of the coin, you know, for those who do come off, why is that? And this uh, really, most of their numbers were reported at the five-year mark. So I know this curve is shown here, which goes all the way out to 15 years, but um, very few men reach that time frame. So anyway, at five years, this is from a multi-institutional Movember GAP3 cohort. It's international organizations pooling together data. So at five years, 56% of the men were still on it, and the remainder has discontinued. Now, the important number, I guess, is that 28% discontinued due to disease progression of some point, of some type, 13% converted to treatment without progression. So again, we're still seeing this happening where men are just deciding they're going to stop active surveillance so we can even have over-treatment occurring sort of in a secondary situation. What I thought was actually another important point that I would wanted to take one second on in that study is that only 2% discontinued to convert to watchful waiting. So I happen to think that we're doing overactive surveillance. I wrote an editorial about this this past year, overactive surveillance, OAS, kind of like OAB. And I think we need to just be mindful that doing all of these additional biopsies and tests for older men with a limited life expectancy may also be causing undue harm. So we should really think about the intensity of active surveillance and potentially reducing that over time as people get older and also, you know, as they have more tests showing a lack of reclassification over time, the conditional probability of having subsequent reclassification goes down. So I, I'm seeing more and more men who've been on active surveillance for a long period of time and I'm using MRI quite a lot and using just the fusion biopsy, especially now that we're doing them transperineal. So I think in the older men, very selectively, you know, we definitely ease off the pedal on the active surveillance. But I still have found some men in their late 70s with high-grade disease, MRI only, that I do think it makes a difference. So you know, I totally agree with you that we need to kind of have – I think we're stratifying people so much better up front now with MRI and fusion biopsies that it hopefully will allow us to – focus more appropriately on, on the right people and, and ease up on the other people. Well, Dr. Walsh used to say to me that the only people that we should operate on in their 80s are the ones who come to the clinic with their parents, you know. So I think, you know, we age is just a number, and I think thinking holistically about general health status. I mean, I've had men in their 70s beat me in the marathon, and, you know, so I think it's just we have to consider somebody who's younger than age 70 might have a lot of comorbidities and similarly should not have very intensive treatment or active surveillance. So this is an update uh, from uh, the PROTEC trial that was is based in the United Kingdom. It wasn't really a trial of active surveillance, but men were randomized to watchful waiting, surgery, or radiation. And in these prospective trials, uh, the, the the data are usually uh, analyzed by intention to treat. And that is, if a, a man was randomized to surgery and didn't get surgery, he was still counted as surgery. And uh, but this is uh, in this they actually evaluated the results in terms of the treatment 
that the patient actually received. And uh, the bottom line is in these in these patients, if they were treated with surgery or radiation, they did better than uh, with uh, active monitoring. So it's a, it's a, it's a it's an important trial, and it's a different way of looking at the data. Um, this is um, uh, a, a, another paper that recently uh, came out of the um, uh, Memorial uh, Sloan Kettering uh, Cancer Center group, and they're looking here now at patients who have Gleason grade group two, that is Gleason three plus four. And uh, so uh, about uh, uh, half of the patients by 10 years came off active surveillance and, uh, and these patients do have a higher risk of, uh, of, of failure and of recurrence than, uh, than men who have Gleason grade group one disease, but uh, some of them and many of them actually do quite well. So this, this study supports uh, a role of active surveillance in selected patients with Gleason grade group two disease. Uh, this is a study looking at four North American institutions uh, and then their active surveillance data. Uh, and they found, compared with uh, watchful waiting, active surveillance biopsies reduce the risk of metastasis at 20 years, but only like 3%, 1% to 2%. I wouldn't call it earth shattering. Sort of what they felt is that if you truly have Gleason 3 plus 3 prostate cancer, that maybe the biopsies could be done every three to four years as opposed to yearly. Now, one shortcoming is that they did not include, uh, you know, MRI or fusion or other biomarkers in this, but I think the data is that probably, as Doug mentioned, we can back off a little bit on how frequently we biopsy uh, the true Gleason 3 plus 3 active surveillance patients. Uh, and this is another study at looking at the SEER database, uh, looking at active surveillance and particularly looking in African-American men. There are only about 15% of the 50,000 patients were African-American. Uh, and what they found is that while prostatectomy and external beam radiation decreased and active surveillance nearly tripled from 2010 to 2015, black men were much less likely to receive active surveillance or watchful waiting compared to non-Black men. Uh, so I think that's something to think about and why that is uh, and what, how we can do a better job in that regard. So this, I think this is an important point because uh, when active surveillance was you know, first developing, it was considered that you know, African-American men have more, more high-risk disease. They tend to have more aggressive disease. And there, there were even papers out saying that African-American men should not be managed with active surveillance. And, uh, and most of the studies really have a relatively small number of, of African-American patients in them. But uh, this study and another study uh, that recently came out actually show that black men do as well on active surveillance as white men, you know, that there's no real, there's no real difference, at least in the limited data that's available. But this shows, unfortunately, that they they are not offered active surveillance as, as frequently as, uh, as, uh, other, as, as other patients. So we'll move on here. Focal therapy. Doug, that's you. Yeah, we always so get criticized. A... We I'm always sorry, get I... criticized because we don't have any articles on focal therapy. So this is, this, this is your lesson on focal therapy for this year. All right. So. This is a hemigland focal cryoablation, or not focal, but hemigland cryoablation for prostate cancer. 160 patients studied res retrospectively. Importantly, no uh, prostatorectal fistula. They report a high continence rate of 97%. 73% of men were still potent. We put the figure down here sort of showing uh, the potency. Uh, so it certainly affected. Um, but uh, they claim that the 73%, even though there's been a big shift in the SHIM scores here, uh, were still potent. 85% remained free of treatment at five years, although depending on how you use the criteria, they standardly use in cryo the Phoenix criteria, which is the Nader PSA plus two as a failure. Um, 
two thirds of patients, uh, the 67%, two thirds of patients had not had a PSA recurrence using the Phoenix criteria. Uh, again, PSA, uh, higher Gleason score are certainly, as we know in every other thing, are important predictors. And this little waterfall plot here is interesting also that there was a fairly significant improvement overall in prostate symptom score index uh, with the cryoablation indicating they've probably also decreased some of their BPH and, and you know, a substantial portion of the patients actually had improved urinary symptoms. Um, not only did they not have incontinence issues, um, so many of them had improved voiding function. So Doug, are, are they doing any cryoablation at Mass General Hospital? No. No. Robert at Northwestern. We're starting, to do it. We're starting to do it at Northwestern. Ashley Ross, who's joined us, is going to do some cryo, but mainly for ra external beam radiation, you know, salvage and things like that. And even he says, you know, it's if it's close to the apex or close to the sphincter, that can be a problem. Uh, I mean, I think it has a limited role as primary treatment. You know, five-year, 85% uh, PSA undetectable or PSA not meeting the Phoenix criteria isn't really going to do it for me. You probably need 20-year follow-up to really determine is is uh, hemi hemigland cryo going to work. But I think it has a role in some external beam radiation failure salvage patients. Russell and Stan, how about University of Chicago? Are they doing any cryo there? Uh, no cryo that I'm aware of, but uh, they did have a HIFU unit uh, bought for last year. Uh huh. And Stacy at NYU? Yeah, we have all that. Uh huh. Does it work? I mean, I think with all these technologies, you know, patient selection is really the real key. And I think there's definitely a, a very small sweet spot. Uh, where some of these may be applicable, um, you know, such as a recurrent setting where there's not many other options or a patient who has, you know, biopsy documented focal intermediate grade prostate cancer that is very concordant with the MRI. Okay, Doug, let's move on to radical prostatectomy. This is a nice study looking at a, uh, contemporary outcomes with pay, of radical prostatectomy versus radiation therapy for high Gleason grade nine and 10 patients. This looked at 10 year cancer specific mortality and overall cause mortality for a large group of patients in the SEER database. Uh, three quarters of the patients who received radical prostatectomy did not have adjuvant radiation. If you look at the prostate cancer specific mortality, these are the middle lines here on the graph. There was no difference between radiation and uh, surgery in terms of the uh, prostate cancer specific uh, mortality. Other cause mortality was much higher with, in the patients with that radiation therapy, though they were substantially older. Um, but the patients who did the best were the ones who were fit enough to undergo radical prostatectomy um, and had favorable pathologic findings, did not need adjuvant radiation therapy. So there is a substantial percentage of patients who do well very well with radical prostatectomy. What's happened, you, we looked at the, uh, the, uh, the epidemiology earlier. This is a paper, uh, a very uh, large practice, single surgeon uh, experience over the past years and comparing the data before the US uh, Preventative Services Task Force recommendations and afterward. And what you see in the orange, continence rate has gone down as they've had to do modify their technique to be take wider margins, do a bit more aggressive surgery, potency has decreased, positive surgical margins have increased, continence has worsened, and overall higher grade and higher stage disease has gone up. So I think most of us are seeing this in, the, in our practices that it's harder and harder uh, to find the, the patients that are, you know, we've just seen so many more higher grade and higher stage patients. Yeah, it's Robert. I mean, I would say the majority of our the patients I operate on are T3A when you get their final pathology back. What do you, what's your experience? No question that there's there's uh and you know I see a lot. Of course, there's a referral bias. I mean, I see a ton of high grade patients and high stage patients, and we're being much more aggressive, in, especially in the younger men. And I think it's great they're doing really well. But um, you know, it is discouraging because you'd love to be able to 
cure the right pe person. And you, I see all these long-term follow-ups of patients I operated on 15 years ago who we probably would have done active surveillance on in most cases, but they've been cancer-free for all these years. Their, their friends are starting to get advanced prostate cancer and they've functionally perfect and they're doing great and they don't have to worry about prostate cancer. So there's something to be said for that, for sure. We're now operating on the right patients at the wrong time. <laughs> so uh, let's go on to the port side. Sure. Neal, um, Dr. Catalona hates laparoscopic surgery, but it, well, so I was, was going to say I was going to say those curves before were just representative of the switch from open versus uh, laparoscopic <laughs> robotic. <laughs> Um, so after all these years, they found nine cases in the literature of port site seeding of prostate cancer. Uh, this this paper, um, you know, it does occur that there are uh, tumor spillage. They're especially transperitoneal in their cases. So this is in the literature they reviewed, plus their own local small number of cases. And there are cases where uh, port sites apparently get seeded. There are cases where maybe some tissue was dropped by uh, taking out some positive nodes and the tissue wasn't completely excised. I think um, you know, there have been some cases where, where needle tracts from prostate biopsy needles have, have been seeded with high-grade disease. It really is a very, very rare event. Um, I think an important lesson that we learned from the GYN uh, surgeons doing the morselating without, without uh, specimen containment and so forth is tumors can can be spattered and, and spread, and you just want to make sure that you treat everything as if it's cancer when you take it out. Robert? Uh, this looks at physical therapy uh, for post-prostatectomy incontinence. Uh, the key point is you need to teach relaxation phase in a lot of patients. So a lot of them have sort of hyperactive or overactive bladders. And a lot of the Kegel exercises just looks at look at strengthening. So, I mean, I would say personally, if patients are having problems at two or three months, or I just don't think they're doing the Kegels properly, we have excellent uh, pelvic floor physical therapists who specialize in it. And I mean, it's it's a savior for a lot of these patients who are just doing the Kegel exercises too often, too much, or incorrectly. Yeah, we use this okay. all the time too. Dan, you ready? <clears throat> yep. So I thought I'd start with a summary slide here to describe a few themes in radiation oncology for prostate cancer in 2020. Uh, first, data continue to emerge on the use of shorter courses of treatment that's called hypofractionation. It's more convenient, more cost-effective, and similarly effective to control the disease. There's increasing attention to quality of life and patient-reported outcomes which is important given the generally good survival outcomes and the existence of multiple treatment options, including surgery and many varieties of radiation. We continue to learn more about how to optimize the therapeutic ratio of radiation for both the intact and the post-op settings, and also how to balance the benefit and risk of hormonal therapy with regard to indication, timing, and length. So uh, first slide here is an update of a classic study. It's the first randomized contemporary dose escalation trial for radiation. Uh, for prostate cancer that came out of MD Anderson, first reported about 10 years ago. The trial tested 78 gray versus 70 gray over seven to eight weeks, treating the prostate and seminal vesicles, no hormonal therapy. Now with 14 years of median follow-up, we continue to see an improvement for the higher dose arm that translates to benefits in freedom from failure, distant metastasis, cancer mortality, 6% goes to 3%, uh, but it doesn't affect overall survival. So uh, just one quick comment here, the, the difference in the doses is actually relatively small with all of this follow-up, especially when you analyze it in terms of cumulative incidence. There's a lot of men who are dying from other reasons, and that diminishes the, the difference. So I think you still have to take a risk-adapted approach in deciding the right dose for men. This is a huge trial called the HYPO-RT study. It's testing the efficacy of a shorter course of radiation. Uh, there's been a lot of studies that have been reported recently on moderate hypofractionation, which is given over four to five weeks. This is giving uh, much larger daily doses over seven total days every other day over two and a half weeks. So this shows that seven days is not inferior to 39 days for biochemical failure. It's 84% uh, freedom from failure at five years. The toxicity differences are mild and only observed in the near term for urinary function uh, with no differences with longer term follow-up through five years. Now, how often is hypofractionation actually utilized in practice? This is a Medicare patterns of care analysis of both breast and prostate cancer, and it does show increasing utilization of hypofractionation for prostate cancer. In 2015, 14% uh, 
2017, up to 17% short courses defined as 30 days or less. It's not as common to do hypofractionation for prostate as it is breast because the data are more mature for breast cancer. Uh, but this may change since in 2018, there was a guideline that came out re uh, recommending short course um, RT to be more standard. Uh, Regarding Stan, comparative- Stan, yeah? Stan with, with, with COVID-19 and the pandemic, how has your practice changed with respect to hypofractionation utilization? Yeah, at the outset of COVID, we, we didn't know what was going to happen and we wanted to plan for the worst. So we thought it wise to offer the shortest course as possible for all men. So that actually spurred us to convert to do SBRT, which is five days or less. Whereas prior, we were holding out for better long term comparative data, phase three randomized data. So we, we started that in about March and we've also um, stopped doing the eight week courses for the long, uh, the, the pelvic nodal high risk patients. And we do those in four weeks. So comparative quality of life is important. This is really excellent work on a large group of men diagnosed in 2011 to 2012 matched with either surgery, radiation, or surveillance. The figures here show quality of life in five domains at five years rated by the EPIC survey where 100 is the best quality of life. And the differences between the treatment options are compared for both favorable risk and unfavorable risk. So the unfavorable risk has two groups. The favorable risk has four groups. And in the favorable risk group, active surveillance is uh, a nice control here. So looking at the favorable risk group, long-term outcomes are worse in urinary continence for radical prostatectomy. It's worse for urinary irritative and bowel function for seed implant. And it's worse for sexual function for radical prostatectomy and brachy. Interestingly, external beam is not different than active surveillance at, at any time point, promoting the idea that this is maybe the most gentle therapy, at least when using th this tool to measure quality of life. For men in the unfavorable risk group, continence and sexual function are worse for prostatectomy and bowel function and hormone vitality are worse for external beam and hormonal therapy. Not advancing for me here. There we go. So uh, in terms of limiting the toxicity of radiation, the rectum is perceived to be the primary limiting structure for safety. A hydrogel has been FDA approved for use to expand the distance between the prostate and the rectum. This gel is inserted transperineally and it lasts for about three months and then gets absorbed over time. But this is a meta-analysis comparing patients with the hydrogel to controls across seven studies, one randomized study, six cohort studies. The success rate of placement is high, 97%. The mean separation is 11 millimeters. And there is a less than 10% rate of men having transient mild procedural complications. The men getting the hydrogel had better radiation dosimetry, which means lower rectal dose, and had less acute and late GI toxicity and better rectal quality of life. However, uh, the absolute benefit for the late grade two or higher toxicity, which is probably the most meaningful line here on the table, was small. So for a 4% absolute difference, the number needed to treat is 25. So I think it's you know, routine use. You could debate whether it's worthwhile or not. So salvage radiation. Um, now, salvage radiation has been commonly thought of as first-line therapy for rising PSA post-op, and that's largely based on retrospective studies suggesting effectiveness. This is a first of its kind study randomized trial comparing salvage radiation to hormonal therapy. Salvage radiation 64.8 gray to the, to the prostate bed without hormonal therapy. The hormonal therapy arm gets bicalutamide 80 milligrams and then for progression gets luprolide indefinitely. The men who fail in the radiation arm go to the ADT arm. So the time to progression was longer for men receiving salvage radiation first. Hazard ratio is 0.5 and there is a tail on the curve about a third of the men did not need hormonal therapy. So the study supports prioritization of post op RT over salvage ADT as first-line therapy. One of the hesitations regarding the use of salvage radiation regards the potential toxicity and the change in quality of life. Uh, in this cohort, quality of life was measured using the EPIC survey in 199 men who had post op radiation. The median time between surgery and radiation was 19 months. The median radiation dose was 68.4 gray and two thirds had pelvic nodes included and hormonal therapy. The rate of grade two or higher late toxicity was low, about 5%, and quality of life was well preserved for the overall population with no differences more than the minimum clinically important difference at any time point for all five domains measured. Now, the overall numbers do kind of cancel out a little bit what happens at each end of the spectrum prior to um, initiating the treatment. So if you look at the people with the best continence and sexual function before radiation, about 20% have a drop over time, but a similar proportion of men with poor function shortly after prostatectomy and before radiation may see an improvement. So 
That's why the numbers look kind of the same. But we advise men with really good function with confidence and potency that they, they're up to a 20% drop. So aside from pre-treatment function, there are some other factors that influence quality of life. Time to radiation, radiation dose affects continence, age, BMI, smoking history, and race affects bowel function, and then age and hormone therapy use affect sexual function. So the question of when to initiate post-op radiation has been a big topic. This is a study that, um, you want to move one back, Bill? I'm trying, I'm trying, yeah, oh, there this you go. It's a study that compared uh, adjuvant radiation to observation and uh, early salvage if needed. The adjuvant radiation was offered for P2, PT2, 3A, and zero disease with a PSA less than 0.5 within three months of prostatectomy with 66.6 grade of the bed without hormonal therapy. Uh, in this study, the rate of biochemical failure was lower with adjuvant radiation at 10 years, freedom from failure, 82% versus 61%. But it's important to see that the cancer-specific mortality was the same, 1% in both arms. And radiation initiated at a median PSA of 0.7 didn't really seem to compromise the late endpoints. So that finding, along with um, the toxicity being higher for the adjuvant group, uh, makes it sensible to consider observation for men with this intermediate risk disease post-op. So hormonal therapy is well known to improve outcomes in men receiving radiation for intact prostate cancer. Uh, this is a long-term update of a study testing hormonal therapy use in the post-op setting. In a prior report of the GTUG AFU-16 study, biochemical control was improved. Now with a median follow-up of 112 months, we see progression-free survival and metastasis-free survival benefits, about 15 percentage points in the progression-free survival and 5 percentage points in metastasis. Um, the benefit is observed in both the low and the high-risk men, including those with a very low PSA. So, the study says if you're looking to maximize the effect of radiation, then you should consider concurrent hormone therapy for everyone. So as for how long hormonal therapy should be given with post-FRT, we don't really have any randomized data to guide us. This is a retrospective study of 1,200 men who received post-FRT with varying amounts of hormonal therapy. The authors described three clinical risk factors for recurrence, T3B disease, gleaconate or higher, or PSA that's more than 0.5. Men with none of the risk factors had no benefit to hormonal therapy. You can see in the chart the clinical recurrence rates were low for the red line, whereas men with two to three risk factors benefited from hormone therapy, including long-term hormonal treatments. Men with just the one risk factor, the blue line, had benefit, but seemed to gain little with longer-term use. So this is a modeling study that suggests that we can consider a risk-adapted approach towards choosing the right length of hormonal therapy in the post-op setting. Uh, it's also possible that PSA level as a single risk factor can help guide decision-making. RTOG 9601 was a large randomized study testing bicalutamide times two years with salvage radiation therapy. It showed an improved survival of 5% at 12 years on report of their final data in 2017. This subset analysis reveals a differential effect on survival based on the pre-radiation PSA level. So only those men with PSA more than 0.6 actually had better overall survival whereas those with the lower PSAs had a survival detriment. The authors uh, suggest that this could be explained by side effects of the hormonal treatment, including two to three-fold higher risk of cardiac and neurologic grade three toxicity in the men on hormonal therapy. So, you know, I think it's a little simplistic to use just PSA alone, but I think the study is important because it suggests that this is a valuable factor to help inform the decision. So this is an interesting study on the value of hyperbaric oxygen, or HBO, for radiation cystitis. Uh, many single-arm studies have suggested HBO can improve late radiation side effects, but it's never actually been tested in a randomized fashion. So the study included patients who had prior pelvic radiation, the median dose is 63 gray, and they subsequently experienced radiation cystitis. They were randomized to get HBO versus standard of care. The average time between the radiation and HBO was four years. Urinary quality of life by the EPIC survey improved uh, significantly for the men on HBO compared to standard of care. 73% had improvement versus 34%, and the average improvement was 18 points on a 100-point scale. The HBO improved general health as well as the cystoscopy grade of toxicity at the expense of a low risk of barotrauma and myopia. And uh, finally, one of the hottest areas in radiation oncology right now is the treatment of men with limited metastatic disease or oligometastasis. This is a small phase two randomized study in which men with prostate cancer who failed local therapy 
and had one to three METs on conventional imaging were randomized to receive SAVER, stereotactic ablative RT, or standard of care treatment. The radiation was given in three to five fractions. The primary endpoint was a composite of biochemical or imaging failure, use of hormone therapy, or death at six months. The men receiving SABER had a much lower risk of failure at six months, 19% versus 61%, and the median progression-free survival was not reached versus 5.8 months. Uh, men on the study had a PSMA PET. The clinicians were actually blinded to the results uh, at the time of the radiation planning, and if the men had all sites of disease on the PSMA PET covered with radiation, they had a much lower rate of new, uh, new metastasis at six months, 16% versus 62%, as well as a longer time to metastasis. The radiation given to the METs had uh, no differences in grade two plus toxicity, and it seemed to stimulate an immune response by uh, profiling of T-cell chronotypic expansion. So this is uh, interesting stuff. It's still early. We're waiting for phase three studies to confirm whether this is real to declare it a standard of care. So Russ, I've been uh, trying to save time for you. Dr. Isaacson here tells me we're 10 minutes behind. So, okay. uh, well, I only have 72 or 75 slides, so we should be okay. Uh, okay. So for advanced disease, um, I wanted to start with uh, a few studies that looked at docetaxel. So you all um, know that docetaxel is a standard of care for metastatic disease, both castrate sensitive and castration resistant. The first study that was recently published was the Alliance study um, that looked at six months of neoadjuvant ADT along with docetaxel followed by prostatectomy versus prostatectomy alone, uh, randomized around 800 men. Um, this study is really quite interesting to me. It showed uh, the, the, the primary endpoint was three uh, landmark three-year biochemical recurrence-free survival, and it did not re that was not uh, uh, shown. However, there was an overall improvement in biochemical recurrence-free survival, as well as a metastasis-free survival and even overall survival. So three other endpoints were met, but not the primary endpoint. So it was a, a negative study, but but otherwise interesting. Now, what about in other settings? So uh, Dr. Liao talked about um, radiation. And so this study looked at patients who were getting radiation and, and ADT for high-risk disease and randomized them to get also docetaxel asteroids or not. And at five years, there was no difference. Um, but it was uh, so, so no benefit in this context. And finally, in the salvage, uh, so um, in, in biochemical recurrent setting, uh, does docetaxel with ADT for a year versus ADT alone, is there a benefit? And with uh, 10 and a half years of follow-up, um, there's no PSA or radiographic progression but the authors say overall survival is still not mature. So in conclusion, docetaxel doesn't have a role and it doesn't improve outcomes in addition to curative intent, radiation, or in the biochemical recurrent setting. However, I would say that in the neoadjuvant setting, we, we, we just don't know yet. Um, so one of the more interesting papers in the last year is uh, this paper that looked at an oral, orally bioavailable uh, LHRH uh, antagonists. So we often use agonists for, for the treatment of metastatic and advanced prostate cancer. Degarelix is an approved antagonist, but it's a monthly injection. This randomized two to one to 48 weeks of oral uh, relugalix uh, versus uh, luprolide. And, and interestingly, they met their primary objective of showing maintained cash rate, rate at, at 48 weeks, 97% uh, versus 90%. Um, and in the first really prospective study to look at major ca cardiovascular events with these agents, it did show a, a decrease in major cardiovascular events, especially in, in, in patients who had a cardiovascular event history with 4% versus almost 18%. So in conclusion, this uh, relugalix I'm gonna have a hard time pronouncing that for years, aren't I? Is the first orally available GnRH antagonist um, it's effective, um, not yet FDA approved, and it does importantly have less cardiovascular events, especially in those with a prior history. Next slide. You're slowing me down, Bill. I know. Sorry. Okay. Go go back up one, please. Okay. So um, in metastatic castration-sensitive prostate cancer. 
we've seen that the standard of chair, care has really evolved over the last few years. We have several studies showing abiraterone uh, has a role. We have several studies showing docetaxel also as a standard of care, metastatic castration sensitive disease. Enzalutamide, we all know well as a next generation potent AR antagonist. In this ARCHES study, which was an international randomized placebo controlled study uh, that include uh, men uh, with metastatic castration sensitive prostate cancer around 62 percent or high volume it met its primary endpoint by showing a very significant improvement in radiographic progression free survival with a hazard ratio of about 0.4 it also reduced time to crpc chemotherapy and skeletal related events uh, so and uh, this along with the next study uh, really show that enzalutamide is a standard of care for, for this patient population. In this study, um, th it was an investigator-initiated open-label study of enzalutamide versus a, an active control in a non-steroidal uh, first-generation an uh, anti-androgen showed not only a PFS improvement that was the same as in the other study, but also showed an overall survival advantage with a hazard ratio of 0 0.67. Um, so in, uh, these two studies have really solidified the fact that enzalutamide can be used as a standard of care option for first-line castration-sensitive prostate cancer. Uh, next slide. What about apalutamide, cousin of enzalutamide? Um, so like enzalutamide, apalutamide is a highly potent AR antagonist. In this study, um, patients were randomized to apalutamide or placebo, similar amount of patients in this study had high volume disease, uh, radiographic progression-free survival, 0 0.48 in, a, in, a, in an analogous overall survival hazard ratio to the Enzymet study. Um, it's, oh, it is well tolerated, but we should know that around 27% get a rash and 6.3% and have grade three rash with, with apalutamide. Apalutamide along with enzalutamide are now added to our choices for uh, standard of care options for castration sensitive first line disease. So, docetaxel, although uh, approved as a standard for metastatic castration sensitive disease, uh, really the, the majority of the benefit is in the high risk patient population with subgroup analysis of the charted study showing no benefit for low risk disease. So, the authors in this paper looked at the Stampede uh, study out of England and looked at the definitions of high and low risk and volume. Bottom line is that abiraterone, regardless of whether you're uh, high risk or, or low risk, shows a maintained uh, overall survival benefit. That being said, the events are slower, so you need more events. Abiraterone can be used in either high or low. So now getting to castration resistant disease. So, um, there is an entity of uh, non-metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer, and we have several agents that are FDA approved. Uh, apalutamide in this paper uh, demonstrated uh, not only uh, a metastasis free survival advantage, which would pr was previously shown, but is now showing an improvement in overall uh, survival, 25% uh, improvement in overall survival hazard ratio, um, even with patients crossing over and getting active therapies. So bottom line is for, for non-metastatic castration resistant disease, early intensification, especially with a short doubling time is, is useful. So in, the, in advanced prostate cancer, one of the biggest uh, questions is how to sequence agents. Uh, we have many orally available agents and this study uh, was a prospective study of uh, looking at sequencing. They randomized patients one-to-one -to, -one to first Abbey then ENDS versus ENDS then Abbey. Uh, with a time to second uh, progression by PS, uh, PSA uh, as the primary endpoint. So if you do ABI then ENDS, your PSA progression uh, is better than ENDS to ABI. Uh, the overall survival is immature, but the curves are overlapping. And uh, so if you're looking at PSA as your endpoint, perhaps ABI and ENDS is a better sequence, although I'll ar argue that uh, Clinically, there, there's probably not a major role to sequence. That gets to the next paper, which is really uh, the landmark paper comparing chemotherapy in cabazitaxel to either abiraterone or enzalutamide for patients who have received both do, uh, docetaxel 
chemotherapy and either abiraterone or enzalutamide already. So randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either the other chemotherapy or the other hormonal therapy and showed a very uh, significant improvement in both progression-free survival with a hazard ratio of about 0.5 and overall survival with a hazard ratio of 0.6 uh, favoring cabazitaxel rather than the the second hormonal agent. There's more uh, AEs with chemotherapy, so it's, it's clearly not right for everybody, but uh, in general, it's superior. Probably the, the next agent we hope to, uh, to have available in prostate cancer is lutetium PSMA. We talked about PSMA, uh, gallium PSMA imaging earlier um, in our review. So lutetium 177 PSMA is a radiopharmaceutical uh, it's been available outside the U.S. for quite some time. Um, so in this single center study, uh, in patients who are PET positive and an and entirely refractory disease, it showed a PSA response rate uh, that was around 50% and a, a pretty uh, large resist response rate in those with measurable disease. Uh, the magnitude of duration and benefit, uh, we don't know, and uh, we will see the vision uh, study presented probably at a a virtual meeting to come before the end of the year, hopefully. So, Russell, um, is is there any evidence on whether when they relapse after lutetium, whether if you retreat them, they respond again, or is nothing known about that? That's it's a good question, and um, my understanding is that we don't have a ton of data, but it's uh, w it's probably not PSMA positive disease that's that's relapsing in, in, in my experience, although we really don't know a lot just yet. It's a good question. Okay. So um, to, to finish the systemic therapy section, we'll talk about immunotherapy. Um, immunotherapy does have a role in prostate cancer. Spool cell T is an adoptive immunotherapy targeting prostatic, prostatic acid phosphatase, and it's effective, especially at lower uh, tumor volumes. So a newer DNA vaccine encoding uh, PAP um, has demonstrated immunologic activity. And in this study, in about 100 men with non-metastatic CRPC with a short doubling time, were randomized to uh, the vaccine with growth factor versus growth factor alone. Uh, interestingly, there was a longer um, metastasis-free survival in patients with very aggressive short doubling times. Um, and this has led to a follow-up study that is ongoing of this vaccine uh, with um, a checkpoint inhibitor in non-metastatic disease. So pembrolizumab uh, is a checkpoint inhibitor that's approved for many indications, but not prostate cancer. So, and this was a multi-cohort study of pembrolizumab uh, for metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. Uh, there was a PDL1 positive measurable, PDL1 negative measurable, and a bone only cohort given standard dosing. Um, I'll say that the 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 response rate was was modest, five percent in, in patients with PDL1 positive disease, uh, and disease control rates were uh, similarly modest. Um, so there's some activity not very high, but it is moving forward, and, and perhaps in earlier disease, it will be more effective. That one question. Okay, so uh, thank, you, thank you very much, and uh, we now have just a few minutes for questions and answers, and I'm sure that, uh, that there may be other questions and answers out there, so I just would like to volunteer that if they send uh, the questions and answers to me at wcatalona at nm.org, uh, Northwestern Medicine, let's, NM stands for Northwestern Medicine, I will distribute them to our panel members and we will try to answer these questions. I'd also like to thank um, uh, Dylan Isaacson, who's a Northwestern Reddit, uh, resident uh, who has helped me with uh, this uh, platform, this website platform, and without his help, I could have never have made it. And uh, and uh, then there's one question that I would like to just uh, ask the panel about that, that came in, and they talk about the studies of, of men who have died accidentally uh, from uh, from one from one cause or another, and that uh, and among young men, 
uh, who are in their 20s and 30s, up to 15% on autopsy will be found to harbor prostate cancer. So do you consider these cancers to be uh, uh, clinically active or potentially clinical act clinically active? Doug, let's start with you. Yeah, it's amazing biology. And when you look at some of the things, like there's the, um, the physician's health studies um, and the um, screening study from Europe where you look at baseline PSAs of men in their 40s and you can predict a PSA below two, but if, if they're in the 85th, 90th percentile, those men are far more likely to go on to have prostate cancer. I've always assumed it means that they just had this process starting at a much earlier age. And I think it's really important that the scientists need to figure this out as to what really are the transforming events, how can we identify these people earlier take care of those earlier and hopefully ignore a whole lot of the other prostate cancers. Um, so it is an amazing thing about prostate cancer biology um, that I think we don't really know. Robert, what do you say? I found this in the past 20 years ago, I remember people talking about this. Uh, I mean, PSA historically does a better job at screening for significant cancers that are gonna cause trouble. So I would certainly be an advocate for screening sooner, but you're not going to have autopsies. You're not going to screen people who've had autopsies. So I'm a proponent uh, of screening at 40 or 45, uh, maybe not yearly necessarily, but starting screening early. Sure, people have prostate cancer early on, uh, but I think if you're carefully screening people, you're going to pick up who uh, is going to have significant cancers. Russell, you're the probably the best scientist among us well real I, I, real scientist i think the key is is um biologically figuring out which are, which are real cancers that are going to cause problems that and not and um and i don't know that we're going to be able to do that without detecting them right so i think the key is going to be to get better at um risk stratifying who needs to be screened earlier and then doing the appropriate imaging and biopsies to really start to understand the biology better that being said you know once you're done using your prostate it's sort of a useless organ so if we could ablate it non you know in a way that wasn't toxic you know i'm all for doing that at you know whatever age you're done having kids but that's probably Stacey. not the only way standard language Stacey, you yeah, are so uh, i think this is a very interesting topic uh, I had seen a systematic review a few years back on autopsy studies and uh, the prevalence across different series was 5% um, among those uh, individuals who died at age less than 30. Uh, certainly, I mean, we do see some very young patients with prostate cancer. When I was a resident, we wrote up uh, all of the Hopkins patients in the prostatectomy database in the 30s. There were about 40 of them, and they actually had a lower rate of biochemical recurrence than the older population. Uh, but yes, I mean, I agree with the other panelists. I think baseline PSA screening in the early 40s is very important since some people do have early onset prostate cancer and also just taking a very uh, careful family history to look for individuals who may have genetic risk factors. Okay, so we're, we are over time. One, one last question that I want to give to Russell and to Stan, and this is, uh, in a patient who has failed, say, radiation therapy and his PSA starts rising, when should you start the ADT? Do you have, should you start it right away? Should you wait until a couple of years after it starts rising? What about <clears throat> the timing of that? Well, you know, you go, go, you go first, Dan. Well, I, I think you take an approach just like uh, as if someone were to present with initial disease. It's a risk-adapted um, assessment of the disease characteristics and the patient um, life expectancy and preferences. So we basically just have a consultation. We make a decision, is it really worth even working up? And in many cases, it's not. If they get radiation, maybe their average age is 70 and the recurrence is not likely to be uh, a threat to them, but the ones that have more aggressive features, we will work up uh, if they if we think that those are a threat to their life expectancy and consider salvage options, including hormone therapy as well as maybe radiation. 
Yeah, so so for patients that come to me, they've usually gone through all the local stuff. I think um, to me, doubling doubling time is really important, and, and that helps me risk stratify. It. Um, and then now with advanced imaging, where with the more sensitive our advanced imaging is getting, perhaps we'll be able to salvage patients or at least uh, delay the time that we will need to give them lifelong hormonal therapy. So I think you know that's also part of it is can we give a shorter amount perhaps with focal therapy um, and then give a longer break is, is going to be the future. Okay, well, so I would like to thank all of the panelists very much for participating. And I would especially like to thank Laura Dietrich of the AUA, who has made this whole uh, virtual operation very painless, and, and she's been tremendously helpful to all of us. Thank you all, and thank you, uh, those of you who have, uh, have been involved on this uh, webinar. Stay safe. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.